Welcome back to ECE 501B. Announcements, project deliverable. I'm getting some emails telling me that this is what they want to do on their project. That's appreciated. You have until, is that Thursday? To get those into either the Dropbox or an email or both actually. Homework 7 is due next week. Homework 8 is due the last day of class. Our final exam is on a Tuesday and the project, the main project deliverable number 2 is due on the last day of class, just as updates. To get us started today, I want to remind us of what we've been working on and that's positive operators. You can think of those as non-negative type numbers, but now we're generalizing those to matrices. Then we will look at some examples of those. We'll show or prove theorem 735, which is dealing with different ways of thinking about these particular matrices. We'll look at a unique positive square root or the theorem associated with the positive square root for every positive operator. And then we'll get into isometries, which is now thinking rotation. And what we want to do is get to the stage where we look at positive matrices and rotations like we might with a complex number. A complex number has, if we think of it in polar form, has a magnitude and an angle. And that tells us how we're stretching or contracting and in what direction if we think about a complex number having a magnitude and angle, that's now how we're going to be thinking about matrices. What do they do in terms of expanding and contracting and how do they redirect or rotate information? And that's what we're dealing with or thinking about with positive operators and isometries. The definition of a positive operator is this self-adjoint operator, which means T is equal to its adjoint. And we also need then this inner product of the linear operator on an arbitrary vector with the arbitrary vector in the second slot, giving us a non-negative real number for all vectors V. That's how we are defining a positive operator. And now for Theorem 735, which we talked about last time, these are equivalent statements relative to an operator being positive. We can say that the operator is positive or it's self-adjoint and all of its eigenvalues are non-negative. Or if we find a linear operator that has a positive square root, then we know that it's <coughs> equivalent to the operator being positive. If we can find, or T, if T is positive, then we know that T has a self-adjoint square root. And finally, as an equivalent statement, <coughs> we can find a linear operator R such that we can decompose the original positive linear operator T in terms of the adjoint of R operating on R itself. Those e statements are equivalent and we will show that via a proof in a little bit, but let's remind ourselves what we're dealing with. We went over this last time, but just as a reminder, if we had a matrix T1, maybe being 1, 0, 0, 0, we can rewrite that or it now has a square root as R1 times R1 where R1 could be either plus 1, 0, 0, 0 or minus 1, 0, 0, 0 and it will give rise to T1. Similarly, T sub 2, that was a little bit more interesting. It could now have a square root or does have a square root R sub 2 of the following structure which is really saying do we have now, in terms of the first column, it's a zero combination of all three columns. R sub 2, or the second column now, is saying let's replace the 
second column with the first column if we multiplied R1 or R sub 2 times R sub 2. And finally, R sub 2 times R sub 2 in the third column says, oh, just copy the second column. And that now gives us T sub 2 as a form of R sub 2 times R sub 2. And T sub 5, that R sub 5, maybe you've never seen a matrix written like that, but just keep all of the upper signs together to create one R sub 5 possibility. Keep all the lower signs together to create another possible way of factoring T sub 5 into R sub 5 times R sub 5. Let's now look at some Q's and see which of those Q's are actually positive and show some different ways that we could write these or determine whether or not these matrices are positive. And remember what it means for a matrix to be positive. We need it to be self-adjoint, and it has to have this inner product relationship where that operator, let's say QV, op inner product with V is non-negative. First example, and I don't want green, so let me switch that to blue. Suppose Q1 is now 1, 0, 0, 2. That one you can immediately see maybe that it's positive. But if we start to look at it in terms of some of these equivalent statements, in order for this to be positive, we need it to be self-adjoint. And for it to be self-adjoint, what does that mean? If we transposed it, since this is real, if we transpose it, it better be equal to what it was before we transposed it. So in this case, we could say, oh, one step of that would be Q sub 1 is self-adjoint, which really means that Q sub 1 is equal to Q sub 1 complex conjugate transpose. But in this case, the conjugate we don't really even need to worry about. And we also need something, another condition, and one condition here, which is jumping out at us, is that's a diagonal matrix already. We know the eigenvalues are on the diagonal, so let's just look at the eigenvalues. And for it to be a positive matrix, what do we need to know or have happen with respect to the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues need to be non-negative in order for it to be a positive matrix. And in this case, since the eigenvalues are explicitly on the diagonal, they are a value of 1 and 2, which those are non-negative. They're actually positive. So from this perspective, we could imply or invoke statement B of the previous theorem of theorem 735 and therefore Q sub 1 is positive. That's one way that we could conclude that Q sub 1 is positive. Another one, another way to determine whether or not that matrix is positive. One, we need it to be self-adjoint and we've already seen that that's true. And two, what about this QV V inner product? What does that look like? Does it give us a non-negative real scalar? In this case, we have the inner product of the diagonal matrix times, let's say, a generic V, which it has to be two-dimensional, two by one inner product with V1, V2. In this case, if we scale, basically that's what we're doing with QV, we're somehow scaling, maybe rotating that vector V. In this case, we end up with V1, 2, V2, and now we want to inner product that with the original vector V1, V2 itself. 
now for this on a real field of numbers we just have v1 the dot product which is now multiplying the coordinates together or we now have v1 squared plus 2 v sub 2 squared and what do we know about that relative to any v1 v2 any v that's non-negative isn't it it's actually positive if we have a non-trivial vector v so we can now say that's greater than or equal to zero for all vectors v in r2 and now we've shown that q1 is self-adjoint and it satisfies that inner product that was the in the definition of our positive matrix or our positive operator and so now we can say that q1 is positive we have several different ways of demonstrating whether some operator is positive. We now have those five equivalent conditions in Theorem 35 in Chapter 7 that we can use. Let's look at another example, matrix-wise, Q sub 2, which is 2 minus 1 minus 1, 4. If we are checking whether or not it's positive, first we want to see is it self-adjoint. Is it? Does it equal its transpose? Yes, so Q sub 2 is self adjoint. And now let's look at that inner product relationship like we had just done before. We now are operating on a generic vector V1, V2 with this matrix Q sub 2 which could be turning it and scaling together if we wanted to think of it that way. Now we have a more interesting first coordinate and second coordinate in the first vector slot. We now have 2v1 minus v2. We actually have some minus signs going on and in the second coordinate of the vector in the first slot we now have minus v1 plus 4 v sub 2. We want to form the inner product of that vector with the original vector v and we now have coordinate wise multiplication And if we continue that, we now have 2v1 squared minus v1, v2 minus v1, v2 plus 4v sub 2 squared. That we can actually factor out a 2. A 2 is common to all of those factors, and we now have v1 squared minus v1 v2 plus 2 v2 squared. We're trying to show that this is non-negative and that negative sign might be concerning us or causing us a little bit of an issue but we know how to complete the square. Or what do we now need to square in order to produce v1 squared minus v1 v2. I'll do the hard part. We need to have v1 and then we have half of that v1 v2, right? Essentially, so we now have v2 over 2 squared. Will that give us what we want? So that now we have v1 squared minus 2 times v1 v2 over 2 and that will give us our minus v1 v2 but now we've introduced this plus v2 squared over 4 and we need to not have the ability to just add arbitrary numbers in so we need to take that away and we can take that away by subtracting v sub 2 squared over 4 plus 2 v sub 2 squared.
and the right to factors or the right to terms actually can be combined. We now have 8 over 4 minus 1 over 4, or we now have V1 minus V2 over 2 squared plus 7 over 4 V sub 2 squared. And what can we say about that expression? The 2 is positive. Inside the bracket, we have non-negative values for all V1 and V2. This is now greater than or equal to 0, and that's what we needed to show. We needed to show the inner product of Q2V with V, I'm sorry, Q sub 2V inner product with V was non-negative. And we did that. Q2 was self-adjoint. and q sub 2 is positive. Just for grins, we could have, but now what do you know about the eigenvalues of q sub 2 in terms of their sign or where they might lie? We know they are non-negative if q sub 2 is, po is positive. And if we computed those, we would verify that. We, the eigenvalues of that matrix actually end up being 1.586 and 4.414. Those are both positive and that reaffirms what we knew they should be. We knew they needed to be non-negative. Let's look at another matrix and see if it looks or can be determined to be positive. Q sub 3 is now 2 minus 4 minus 4, 4. Is Q sub 2 self-adjoint? In order for Q, oh, Q sub 3. Q sub 3 is self-adjoint. Q sub 2 is self-adjoint from before. But we need to show that, or we need to verify that Q sub 3 is. Q sub 3 is self-adjoint. Now we need to see if its inner product is non-negative when we mult or use Q sub 3 to scale some arbitrary vector. Or we now have Q sub 3 V inner product with V. Q sub 3 structure is not that much different from the structure before, is it? Q sub 2. Q sub 2 was 2 minus 1 minus 1, 4. Now we have 2 minus 4 minus 4, 4. Ne the signs are still the same. The numbers are numerically a little bit different on the off diagonals. Following the same approach that we had last time. Let's just produce what we have now. Coordinate-wise multiplication. distributing all that, those terms. And that also can have a 2 factored out of it. And we now have V1 squared minus 4v1v2 plus 2v sub 2 squared. If we do our completing the square strategy again, we have v1 minus what now do we need to put in there to square to yield 4v1v2? We need half of that, sort of, so we have minus 2v sub 2 squared. Now we've added in 4v sub 2 squared. We need to get rid of it. But we still have 2v sub 2 squared. But 
now we have the following. We have 2 times v1 minus 2v sub 2 quantity squared minus 2v sub 2 squared. And what can we say about the sign of that expression? Does it have a definite sign? No. We could make this have any sign we want by the appropriate choice of V1 and V2. This is then indeterminate. Where we could make Q sub 3 VV actually negative if we selected V to be 1 and 1 where now we have in the first term we have 1 minus 2 which is now minus 1 squared or 1 minus 2 so there's our minus sign for that inner product and we can find a Q sub a V that's positive if we just neglect the second coefficient or the second coordinate. If we looked at what would you expect to see for the eigenvalues of Q sub 3? Pardon? Probably we would have a mix maybe, right? Since we can have either a positive or negative value coming out of the inner product in this case, we know that we're not going to get two positive values since it didn't turn out to be positive. In fact, this matrix has eigenvalues of minus 1.123 and 7.123. Or Q sub 3. Is not positive. Those are just some examples of what you can think about or envision when somebody says you have a positive operator. It now produces an inner product that's non-negative. Let's look at proving that theorem that interrelated or had these five equivalent statements. And now you may want to refer back to those. But now we want to show that A, B, C, D, and E are the same. They're equivalent. And there's all sorts of ways of doing this. But I want to chase my tail today. I want to say A implies B, B implies C, C implies D, D implies E, and E implies A. And then I'll be done. All right? Very straightforward approach to that proving the equivalence of those five conditions. That's my strategy. Let's now start then with the first one, that A implies B. And I may have to go back and remind myself what some of these are, but statement A said that the linear operator was positive. Statement A says that T is positive. From the definition of what it means to be a positive operator, What does that tell us? That was two pieces, wasn't it? What was the first piece? T is self-adjoint, and we needed TVV to be non-negative for all V. Well, if that's true for all V, let's pick some specific Vs. 
and the specific V, let's let V be an eigenvector of that operator T. So let's let V be an eigenvector. Which now says that if I have TV inner product with V, if V is in fact an eigenvector, I can rewrite TV in what way? Now I know that V is invariant to T and it just is get, getting scaled by the eigenvalue lambda associated with the eigenvector V. But from statement A, we know that TVV is greater than or equal to zero. So we know that this was greater than or equal to zero. And we know one of the properties of our inner product. We can slide out that scalar from the first slot. Or we now know that lambda, scaling the inner product of V with V, is also non-negative. But for a non-trivial V, we know that the inner product of V with itself is non-negative. Actually, for a non-trivial, it's positive. So we can divide that out, and that now tells us lambda is greater than or equal to zero. And that's now showing then that A implies B. We needed to show that for statement B, the operator was self-adjoint and all of its eigenvalues are non-negative. And we just did that. We showed that it was self-adjoint. That's from the definition of the operator being positive. So now if we can remember what we just ended up with, that was B. Let's use B to show C. We now know that this operator T is self-adjoint. And if it's self-adjoint, we know that we can find an orthonormal basis for that particular operator from the spectral theorem. So given T is self-adjoint, we can now know that we can find an orthonormal or we can form an orthonormal basis from our spectral theorem. And B, statement B, said that all of the eigenvalues of the operator are non-negative. That's statement B. If that's the case, let's go ahead and define or let the following relationship be true. We know the lambdas are non-negative, so we can take the square root of these non-negative numbers. And we have basis vectors for all of those non-negative eigenvalues. Meaning, let's go ahead and just say that some matrix R times an eigenvector, let's say E sub J, is equal to the square root of lambda sub j e sub j. We're just saying some r exists that makes this true. And this we can do for all of our j's. Let's maybe see where this r might be, since we said let's just define r e sub j to equal the square root of r sub j e sub j. We're saying we're building a matrix r that has the same eigenvectors that t had. Its eigenvalues are just the square roots of the original t's eigenvalues.
the aside is constructing R. So if you didn't pick up a hard hat on your way in, you can put one on now. Or go get one. No, don't leave. I, it's not going to get that dangerous yet. But now we have the idea that if we had this true for all E sub J, let's just concat or just put all of those E's into a matrix. E J's are just columns. Let's just form an a matrix of those N columns. And post multiply R with those columns. Well, we know that the result of R E1 is the square root of lambda 1 E1. And we can create that answer by scaling E1 with the square root of lambda 1. And we can do the same thing with E sub 2. And we can keep doing that all the way down to lambda to the n sub n. Are we okay with that? I've now simply rewritten all n of these relationships that I had above. I said, let's just define this relationship. R e sub j equal to the square root of lambda sub j e sub j. The e's are coming because we have an orthonormal basis. The lambdas are the, eigen, the non-negative eigenvalues of t. But if this is a matrix of E1 through E sub n, we could call that E. And what is that E? That's our matrix of orthonormal basis vectors. And if this is a basis, we know they're linearly independent. In this case, they're actually orthogonal, and they've been normalized. Each vector, if we multiplied it by itself, we would get 1. So we know that it has an inverse, that capital E matrix. Or we can now post-multiply both sides of this equation by capital E inverse. And then we'll just have isolated the R matrix. And that's what we said we were trying to create or that we were constructing in this little aside. Or we've now shown how we can now create R. That's now E, the right-hand side, times this diagonal of square roots of the eigenvalues of T. times E inverse. And we will be able to say something a little bit more clean, maybe about E inverse in a minute. But for now, we just needed to say that we could invert it. And because it's a basis, we know that we can do that. We now have this relationship that's true for our linear operator T. And we're trying to show C whatever C was. C is that T has a positive square root. Oh, maybe that's why we were taking the square roots of these eigenvalues. R is going to be this matrix that we want for C. We now have R EJ equal to the square root of lambda J EJ. But what if I just get cute and I multiply that R e sub j by R on the left? If I now take R times R e sub j, what do I obtain? Well, the piece in parentheses is just a scaled version of e sub j. It's not that whole R e sub j if I don't want to think of it that way. So I now have r times the square root of lambda j e sub j. 
but the square root of lambda j is a scalar, I can slide that in front of r, and I now have the square root of lambda sub j r e sub j. That r e sub j we know is nice. We now have the square root of lambda j, but this in blue parentheses is just the square root of lambda j e sub j again. Or this is now lambda j e sub j, which if we go all the way back to where we started, that's just r squared e sub j is lambda j e sub j. But what was r squared? We now have r squared e j is equal to lambda j e sub j. But lambda sub j e sub j was t e sub j. That's how we defined the lambdas and the e's to begin with. And now we can see that if we have something on the left equaling something on the right, those somethings must be true, and that's true for all values of j. Or we've now shown, starting with statement b, that we now have a piece of statement c. We now know that r is a square root of our original operator t. But I believe statement c had a little bit more to it. Statement c said it was a positive square root. We've now shown that we do, we are able to build a square root for t or find a square root for t. We now want to determine is r positive. And what are the two characteristics of something being positive, by definition? First, it has to be self-adjoint. Or R needs to be the ad equal to its adjoint. Let's, how did we define R? R was this E. Let me abbreviate that diagonal matrix as lambda to the one half. Now you know what that means. That's just this square root with the square root. I'm sorry, this is a diagonal matrix with square roots of lambdas on the diagonal. That's what I'm meaning by capital lambda to the one half E inverse. But E was an orthonormal matrix. And that means then that to find the inverse, really we just need to take the complex conjugate of the transpose of that matrix. Let's now look at what would happen if we would conjugate our transpose which is equal to our conjugate transpose. Or now we're taking E, lambda, well, how do I, I'm sort of doing the, let me say that this is now equal to our conjugate transpose so that I now conjugate R, which is E star lambda to the one half star E to the minus one star transpose. And now I can transpose that so that I now have e to the minus 1 star transpose, lambda to the 1 half 
starred transposed and E starred transposed. But what's E inverse starred transpose? E inverse was just transpose star, so that's getting back E. What happens when I transpose a diagonal? I get the same thing, and if I conjugate a real set of numbers, I get those back. So what's in there is now lambda to the one half. And what's E star transpose? That's equal to, by definition, E inverse. And that actually is the definition of R. And now we've shown then that R is self-adjoint. Question? So now we can say, the question was, can we say that E inverse is equal to E transpose? We are st still potentially dealing with an orthonormal basis. But since T is self-adjoint, I think we can say that we now have these orthonormal basis vectors are real. So in that case, we wouldn't really have to be carrying around this conjugate all the time. But I am just to be complete, I guess. Where are we? That's self-adjoint. Now we need to show that it's satisfying this inner product relationship. which we now want to show that RVV inner product is the sum of A sub J. These are just potentially complex numbers magnitude squared times the square root of lambda sub J. And that's just a sum of complex num or I'm sorry, of non-negative numbers, which is non-negative. And that's what we want to show. We want to show that the inner product of RV with V is greater than or equal to zero. Meaning we want to try to find this relationship or show that RV comma V is in fact this summation of non-negative numbers. I guess if it was a book, I would just say it can easily be shown. But we can s step through that. For any arbitrary V, and if we have an orthonormal basis, we can write or expand V in terms of those orthonormal basis vectors. We can say that V is now A1 E1 plus A sub 2 E sub 2 plus dot, 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 plus A sub N, E sub N. That's how we can decompose an, a generic vector V. If we now apply R to that V, what happens? And remember, those E's are eigenvectors of R. Or we can now say that we have A1, R, E1. A, the A's are scalars, so they can be slid through the R. That's not a problem. But now each of those terms, R, E to the J, are just scaled versions of the e to the j's. And they're scaled by the eigenvalues. Or we now have a1, and the eigenvalues of r were these square roots of the original eigenvalues of t. So we now have a1 square root of lambda 1 e1 plus a sub 2 square root of lambda sub 2 e sub 2 
etc. a sub n square root of lambda sub n e sub n. And that's RV. And if you like that RV, I have another RV in the parking lot, then we can do some... Never mind. Now what do we have? We want to form RV with V. But what's V right there in the top? That's now in the second slot. And if we take V with this particular inner product, we need to conjugate each of those terms and operate, use those to then scale RV. But RV now we've put into this particular structure. And what do we know about the inner products of E1 and anything other than E1? Since E's are orthonormal. E1 times E sub 2 conjugate is zero. They're orthogonal, aren't they? So that now we're going to simply have fall out A1 times its conjugate, since we're conjugating V. So we now have A1 times its conjugate, which is the magnitude of A1 squared. We haven't done anything with lambda 1. That was in the first slot, so that stays. But now the only piece left in that whole product is E1 times E1 conjugate, and that's just 1 plus a sub 2 squared square root of lambda sub 2, and it just keeps going, and plus a sub n squared times the square root of lambda sub n. And that's what we were trying to show that the inner product of RV with V was equal to. We know that that's non-negative, and we've now been able to show statement B can, can be shown to be equivalent to statement C. Statement C is that we have a positive square root of the linear operator T. And now we want to show that if we start with a positive R, in statement C, what do we know about a positive R? It satisfies two pieces, and the only thing we need from those two pieces in statement D is that it's positive. I'm sorry, that it's self-adjoint. And so statement C almost trivially then implies statement D. Because if something's positive, it's self-adjoint, and it has that inner product relationship. So being positive, R that is, that implies that we now have a self-adjoint square root of our linear operator. D implies E. R is self-adjoint. And it's a square root of T. So if we start with T and we write that as R squared, we can write R squared as R with itself. But... R is self-adjoint, so we can replace the first R with its adjoint without changing anything. And so because of this, which R is self-adjoint, we now concluded statement E, which was that T can be rewritten or factored as R adjoint times R. And that's statement E. We've gone all the way around. Now we need to come from our tail to our nose. We've gone from our nose all the way down to our tail. Now we need to go back from the tail to our nose. 
need to circle back around. So now we need to show that E implies A, and then we'll have completed the demonstration or the proof of all five of those statements. With statement E, we're given that T is R dagger R. What are we trying to show? We're trying to show that A is positive. So now we can need to show that it's self-adjoint and it satisfies that inner product relationship. It needs to show those two things. If we take the adjoint of T, that's now taking the rightmost term in that bracket first and taking the adjoint of that and then it's taking the first term in the original par parenthetical expression which is our dagger and daggering that or we now have our dagger R and that's exactly T so now we've shown that T is the same as T dagger or T is self-adjoint and if we look at this inner product relationship and use what we know T is equal to from statement E. We know T is R dagger R, but this now we can slide a piece of that first operator to the second slot. We can keep RV, but now let's take the adjoint of the adjoint in the second slot, but that's now just returning R again and that is greater than or equal to zero by the positivity of our inner product. So starting with statement E, we've now shown that T is statement A, which is T is positive. And that now allows us to get all the way around from head to tail and back from tail to head. Now let's remind ourselves a little bit about square roots. Suppose we have the square root of lambda we're going to say that that now denotes the unique non-negative square root of a non-negative lambda. And what we want to do now is take this number relationship and generalize it to linear operators. So that now we want to use that same generalization in terms of notation and say when we write the square root of a linear operator, we are defining that to be the positive square root of t. Yes. So now what we're doing is if we write so the question is, are we restricting lambdas to reals at this point? In terms of this notation, we are restricting those to be reals. And now we have this notation of the square root of 
our operator T. And let's now look at another proposition, Proposition 36, which says each positive operator has only one positive square root. That's sort of the title that's given to label Proposition 36. Each positive operator has only one positive square root. We've seen that we could have many different square roots. We want to now focus on the one that's positive. Here, we're really just sort of restating that heading. Every positive operator on our vector space V has a unique positive square root. And we can sort of go back to that proof that we were just dealing with and the construction in statement B that we use to show statement C. And the proof of Theorem 35. Which shows that it's possible. And we will refer you, or I will refer you to the book for the actual proof. Let's look at an example of where we, or how we might find the square root of a matrix. Find or compute the square root of what we've already looked at before, the square root of Q sub 2. Suppose that Q sub 2 is 2 minus 1 minus 1, 4 from before. And we know the eigenvalues of Q sub 2. Those are 1.58579. 5, keeping track of all these digits. And 4.41421 4, where let's go ahead and call this smaller eigenvalue lambda sub 1. And the second eigenvalue lambda sub 2. And we can find the eigenvectors of Q sub 2. And let's call those X as a matrix. So we now have minus 0 0.92388 and minus 0 0.382683. And we now have 0 0.382683 and minus 0 0.92388. And I think it's, so this is now our orthonormal basis. And this one is the one associated with lambda 1. This is the 
eigenvector associated with lambda sub 2. This is our orthonormal basis. And it should be clear that if you look at x times its transpose, you will get the identity matrix. Now what we want to do is find the square root of Q. So in this case we're saying that R sub Q E1 is the square root of lambda 1 E1. And R sub Q E sub 2 is the square root of lambda sub 2 E sub 2. That's how we are defining R sub Q. It needs to satisfy both of those equations or we now have r sub q times e1 e sub 2 but this is just the matrix x is equal to e1 e sub 2 times the square root of lambda 1 square root of lambda 2 on the diagonals And now we can solve for this unknown R sub Q. The others are all known. The X and the lambdas are known. Or now R sub Q is X times the square root of lambda 1, square root of lambda 2, times X inverse. But this is just X transpose. And we end up, if we formed that matrix product, we would have 1.3 825 minus 0 0.297593 and we get the same in the off diagonal entry minus 0 0.297593 and 1.97774 And from that particular matrix construction, we now can form Q sub 2 as the product of that R sub Q, or R sub Q is now the positive square root of Q sub 2. And now we've played a little bit more with these positive operators. Let's look at the next thing. The positive operator allows us to contract or expand relative to these eigenvalues. Let's now, and those are non-negative values, let's now look at the second piece of this puzzle which are not positive operators but isometries. And if we were all students of Greek, iso means same or equal. Metron or metros means measure. So equal measure is what isometries says. This is now coming definition 37. Says the following. An operator... S is an isometry if we have the following relationship. If I look at the norm of that operator applied to any vector V, that's going to be the same as the norm of the vector V for all vectors in our vector space. So an isometry is such that it really preserves the norm.
we can say then that isometries are norm preserving. I haven't altered the norm by operating on, or I haven't disturbed the norm of that non-zero vector v by operating on it by s. s now is just doing some rotations, is one way of thinking about it. And it's now a generalized rotation. If I give you a vector and I say rotate it, you haven't changed the length of that vector. That's how you can sort of think of an isometry. Or if you wanted to boil it down even more simply in terms of a real number, you could think of isometries as staying head on or just turning around as being a 1 or a minus 1, so that it now has a norm of 1. So it can think of isometries as a generalization of 1 or minus 1. Let's play around a little bit. Try to get familiar with this operator S. Let's suppose we let S be a linear operator on our vector space V with the following. Let's say that S e to the j is equal to lambda sub j e to the j. So now S has eigenvectors e sub j and eigenvalues lambda sub j and let's make those eigenvectors orthonormal. Let's see what happens when we look at the norm of S V and the norm of V. Or what happens to this set of eigenvalue eigenvector relationships, or really what happens to the eigenvalues lambda j when we force the norm of SV to equal V? And remember the E's form an orthonormal basis on V so that we can rewrite any or we can expand or decompose V in terms of these E's. If we have V, then we can write, and how do we do this decomposition? Well, we take the inner product of V with all of these basis vectors. And that's now the scaling of each of these representative basis vectors. So we now take the component of V in the direction of E1 and use that inner product to scale E1. And we do the same for all the other vectors. That's the decomposition of a generic vector V in terms of this orthonormal basis of E. If that's the case, what's the norm squared of V? That's V inner product with V. But now if we put the V that we've just decomposed in each of those slots of V, what's going to happen? What do we know about the E's? They're orthonormal, aren't they? So the only piece that's going to fall out in this whole inner product is I'm going to have VE1, that's a scalar in the first slot, 
And when I multiply it by V in the second slot, I'm taking the complex conjugate of the second slot's components. So I'm going to have this scalar VE1 times its conjugate. And I'm going to be doing that for each of these coordinates in the vector V. Or I now end up with the absolute value of VE1 squared plus the absolute value of VE sub 2 squared, or the inner product. So now we have the absolute value of the inner product of VE sub n magnitude squared. What if we do the same thing when we're looking at SV? This is now what we have for a generic vector V in our vector space decomposed in this orthonormal basis and we now want to find its norm squared. And we just did. Now the same for S operating on V, where S we're saying now has this particular relationship. S e to j is equal to lambda sub j e sub j. So that now if I apply S to V, I have V e1, that's a scalar, but the S can now slide through that scalar and I have S e1. Plus V e sub 2 inner product with S e sub 2. And I can just keep going so that I now have V e sub n inner product S e sub n. But what's S e j? That's this lambda j e sub j. So I now have lambda 1 inner product V e 1 e 1 plus lambda sub 2 inner product of V e sub 2 with e sub 2. And I just keep going with that so that I now have lambda sub n V e sub n e sub n. If that's now my vector that results when I operate on V with S, I can now put this in a inner product so that if I have SV's norm squared, that's SV with SV. And what results out of that? Now lambda 1 inner product VE1 is a product of two scalars, and I'm taking those and scaling these orthonormal vectors, the orthonormal vectors fall out except for when we have Ej times Ej. And I now have lambda 1 inner product Be1 times the conjugate of that, or I now have the absolute value of lambda 1 inner product Be1 squared. And I'm just summing those. Or I can now have lambda 1 squared in norm uh, or the absolute value of VE1 squared plus lambda sub 2 squared absolute value of VE sub 2 squared and that just continues. But if I now compare this expression with that expression in black, what's that tell me? I now have this norm squared. It has to equal this norm squared. Or if they are equal, what does that say about the absolute values of my lambdas? then those need to be 1 for all j.
And what we will do is we will pick up at that point next time, but we'll start to learn a little bit more about these isometries. But one thing that we will learn is that these isometries are injective. If this is true, if, F, if the norm of SV is equal to the norm of V, we know that S cannot have a non-trivial null space. If it did, then we could have SV producing zero vector, which we know the zero vector has a norm of zero, and that's supposed to equal the norm of V when V is non-trivial, and that has to be something other than zero. So we know that these isometries have to be injective, and we'll pick up at that point on Wednesday.